Chapter 4, God's Spokesman, New Testament. One might think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John would be the primary spokesman during this time period. Although these men were spokesmen, the major part of their influence took place through the pen. These four men are the names of the four books in this section. However, the primary spokesmen were John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ. The chart on page 63 is titled, The Gospel's Spokesman. Section E, The Gospels, Matthew through John. Much like the Acts of the Apostles, this section presents a transition from spokesman to spokesman, or in some cases, more than one spokesman at a time. The Gospels is a group open with John the Baptist, set forth as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Matthew 3.3. 3. Because of his preaching, King Herod silenced him in prison, and Jesus picked up where John left off, Matthew 4.12. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. After a time of training, the Lord's disciples, his students, became his apostles or sent ones and went forth proclaiming the Lord's message. Luke 6, 13. Luke 6, 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Luke 9, 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together, and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God to heal the sick. The chart on page 64 is titled, The Acts of the Apostles, Spokesman. Section F, The Acts of the Apostles. Much error originates from this one book. For this reason, it is imperative that the book of Acts be read, studied, and taught within the framework of God's intended usage. Failure to do so has produced innumerable schisms and many false teachings. The book of Acts is not necessarily more transitional than any other portions of Scripture. However, the transitional aspects must be emphasized by any true Bible teacher. Without understanding the proper context of Acts, the application of doctrine and practice within the New Testament church becomes completely distorted. Again, this book of the Bible is misconstrued, misapplied to the peril of those truly seeking to know and follow the truth. The next chart provides the reader with the spokesman of this book, predominantly Peter and Paul. The Ministry of Peter The Gospels point to Simon Peter as the obvious earthly leader amongst the apostles. Luke 22, 31 and 32, Mark 16, 7, John 21, 1 through 17. This leadership role continues into the early part of the book of Acts. Acts 1, 15 through 26, Acts 2, 14 through 41, Acts 3, 1 through 26, Acts 4, 8 through 12, Acts 5, 3 through 11. During these chapters and beyond, an individual desiring to know the will of God, would have listened to the words of Peter, along with the other apostles. Although the transition away from Peter began early in the book of Acts, he remained the primary speaker through Acts chapter 12. After Acts chapter 12, Peter appeared as a spokesman only one more time in the book of Acts. In this instance, found in Acts 15, 7, Peter was called upon by the Jerusalem Council leadership to testify to the validity of Paul's budding ministry. As designed by God after Paul's conversion, Peter's position, influence, and leadership diminished until it was no longer mentioned. Footnote number one. Those who mistakenly refer to Peter as the rock do not realize that it was Peter's confession that was to become the rock upon which Jesus would build his church. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. That confession was the rock upon which the church was to be built. Beginning in Acts chapter 13, Paul became God's primary messenger, chosen spokesman, throughout the remainder of the book of Acts. The Ministry of Stephen Before the book of Acts turns the focus completely upon the chief church-age spokesman, our attention chronologically focuses upon another of God's spokesmen. Stephen preceded the most influential spokesman of the church age and preached an important transitional message. His message and martyrdom immediately led to the introduction of a man named Saul, or Paul, the most vociferous persecutor of the church at that time. 
Stephen's message precipitated the shift from Peter to Paul. Few sermons have dictated the course of history like Stephen's preaching in Acts chapter 7. Although Stephen's message and ministry were quite short, the effect of this single sermon had future ramifications upon the Jews and Gentiles that have lasted for almost two millennia. Stephen's sermon chronicled the history of the nation of Israel from the calling out of Abraham, Acts 7, 1 through 3, to the building of Solomon's temple, Acts 7, 47 through 50. Immediately following his history lesson, Stephen got to the primary objective, the Jews' abuse and murder of the Old Testament prophets, Acts 7, 51 through 53. He then pointed out to them as the murderers of the just one who the prophets foretold would come. By killing the Messiah, the Jews rejected the very law they claimed to love and uphold. How did the Jews respond to this national message of rebuke? They again did that which happened all too often to those espousing unpopular truths. They murdered the messenger. As the life of God's messenger was slipping away, he saw, quote, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, Acts 7, verse 56. This is the same Son of Man who was told to sit on my, that is, God the Father's, right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. You can read Hebrews 1.13 with Ephesians 1.20 and Colossians 3.1, Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews 8.1, Hebrews 10.12. Who was it that gave his approval to such a violent crime against God's spokesman? Amazingly, it was the next spokesman whom God used, Saul, whose name was changed to Paul, Acts 18.1. The ministry of Paul. As has been stated, Paul's ministry truly blossomed in Acts chapter 13. In this chapter, Paul picked up where Stephen finished, saying, Men of Israel, give audience, Acts 13, 16. However, Paul's audience would branch out far beyond his Jewish audience, as he was to become God's chosen vessel to bear my name, that is Jesus Christ's name, before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, Acts 9:15. Paul started ministering to the Jews, Acts 13, 46, but eventually held the office of the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11, 13. As such, God gave Paul additional revelations of which he testified as he traveled the world, delivering his God-given message. God gave him the message for those individuals living in the church age that was now being revealed by the Spirit to the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 3, 5. Although not alone in ministering to this people group, there is no doubt that God chose Paul to become the primary spokesman of the church age. Section G, the epistles, Romans through Jude. Although the church age is presently approaching two millennia, that is 2,000 years, its spokesmen are comparatively few in relation to the other lengthier periods. Historically within the Bible, this portion of scripture covered approximately 55 years but doctrinally and practically, its coverage continues through the present day. Like the Jews under the Old Testament who had the writings of Moses, the church today has the writings of the apostles long after their deaths. Before we pinpoint our chronological location in the church age, recognizing the spokesman of this section is of utmost importance. On page 67, the chart, the epistles, spokesman. The Apostle Paul indisputably served and serves as the chief spokesman for this section, writing over 80% of the chapters. We are first introduced to Paul, that is Saul, at the stoning of Stephen, recorded at the end of Acts chapter 7. Two chapters later, the book of Acts records Paul's conversion while on the road to Damascus. Page 68 has the chart, the epistles, primary spokesman. As previously mentioned, till the time of Paul's conversion, Peter served as God's main spokesman. Shortly thereafter, Peter virtually disappeared from the scene. One of the few times Peter reappeared is found in Galatians, that is Galatians 2.11. Galatians records Paul's rebuke of Peter for his hypocrisy concerning the behavior he exhibited toward his Gentile brethren when some converted Jews from the church in Jerusalem came to Galatia. He feared the reaction of these brethren, according to the flesh, more than continuing to live the godly testimony before his Gentile brothers in Christ. Beginning in Acts chapter 13, we read about Paul's missionary journeys. In the last chapter of the book of Acts, Paul was imprisoned in Rome. As we turn the page in the next book of the Bible, Romans, the first word reveals much, Paul. His name is recorded as the first word in 13 consecutive books, Romans through Philemon. 
These 13 epistles, among others in this section, address a specific group, the body of Christ, during a specific period of time, the church age. This is a crucial truth for a child of God to understand in this age. Historically, God's use of Paul as a messenger to the church parallels God's use of Moses pertaining to things related to the law. Throughout history, God's message has generally been conveyed in this same manner as the message outlasts the life of the messenger, Hebrews 11.4. This is what the Bible means by he being dead yet speaketh. Obviously, the law outlasted Moses' physical existence upon earth. The church age epistles have likewise outlasted their writers by almost 2,000 years now. God's use of Paul also prophetically parallels God's use of the 144,000 Jews and the two witnesses during Daniel's 70th week. The Bible can be viewed very simply in the fashion shown in this book. Every Bible student must determine the period in which he lives and the corresponding God-designed spokesman or spokesmen for that age. For ease of reference, examine the previous chart. If you are reading these books prior to the church's rapture, obviously following the cross, you are placed within the period identified as the church age. This locates you to the right of the cross and still to the left of the rapture in one of the most glorious periods in all of human history. A word of caution. The books found in this section, Romans through Jude, are the primary books covering this period of time. However, all other scripture remains profitable. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, 2 Timothy 3.16, even the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul admonished the Corinthian believers concerning the usefulness of the Old Testament. He encouraged these early believers and all those who would follow to consider and study the lives of the Old Testament saints as examples for Christians to know how to live holy in the present age. 1 Corinthians 10, 6-14. In the end, to be balanced scripturally, all scripture must be studied in light of what has been said directly to and for the church. Many people wonder how they can know for sure if a scripture, epistle, or doctrine outside the recognized church age epistles applies to the child of God today. The answer comes only after diligent Bible study. In fact, once the student learns the truths presented to the church, the answer is clear. God led Paul to admonish believers to consider what he said in order to have the appropriate understanding of all things, especially spiritual truths. 2 Timothy 2.7 Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Quite simply, the scripture, epistle, or doctrine in question outside of the church age epistles cannot violate the explicit truths, instructions, and doctrines given to the New Testament church. If any passage seemingly contradicts the church age directives, that truth should not be pulled out of the intended context and twisted to fit where it does not belong. The doctrines and truths applicable to one period should never be forced to make any truth apply to every other period. However, over-application of this truth has been far too often the cause of doctrinal error and schisms amongst Bible believers today. Before proceeding, it is important to address a common misconception. There are some people who claim to do everything within the Bible but fail to read the extensive requirements in the Old Testament or the future application of certain doctrines applicable for those after the church's departure. It is absolutely impossible to obey everything in the Bible simultaneously. We must, however, obey the commands given by our spokesman in order to comprehend exactly what it is that God would have us to do. Page 70, the chart is titled Prophecy, New Testament Breakdown. Section H, Prophecy, New Testament, Revelation. As has been previously noted, the book of Revelation uniquely contains portions of Scripture pertaining to several time periods. The first few chapters are addressed to seven literal historical churches in Asia Minor and reveal a spiritual application to the entire period covered in the previous section, the epistles. The remaining chapters of Revelation prophesy of events yet in the future, events that follow the period covered by the epistles, the post-church age period. To understand the initial chronology of Revelation, the reader must read this book from John's perspective. As far as a chronology, this would make Revelation 4.1 the primary point of demarcation between the epistles and Revelation's future applications. Following the details given in the first three chapters of Revelation, 
designated as the past, the reader first finds John in the present being caught up into heaven. Revelation 4.1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. The book of Revelation naturally divides itself by chronologically providing an internal division of past, present, and future. These three divisions are clearly and definitively delineated in the first chapter of Revelation as the things which thou hast seen, past, the things which are, present, and the things which shall be, hereafter, future. That's found in Revelation 1.19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Obviously, John was caught up in the first verse of Revelation chapter 4 in the present. Yet the past, the future applications, will be just as obvious. Here was the past from John's perspective. Revelation one twenty, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Before John wrote about and wrote to the seven churches as recorded in the first three chapters of Revelation, he had already seen them, Revelation one twenty. The seven churches representing the 2,000 years of church history were considered past from John's unique perspective in Revelation and specifically as we find John in heaven in Revelation four one. The future from John's perspective is also easily pinpointed because of the Bible's internal cross-referencing. John was told in Revelation 1.19 to write the things of the past, present, and future with the future described as the things which shall be hereafter. Now consider the wording in chapter 4 after John was caught up. He was told that he would be shown things that would take place hereafter. Revelation 4.1 after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. On page 72, the chart is titled, Revelation Chronology. After Christ's return for the church and its removal from earth, represented by John's ascension into heaven in Revelation 4.1, the Lord again turns his focus primarily upon the Jewish people. This transition from the church back to the Jews will take place following the Blessed Hope and begin the time called Daniel's 70th week, also known as the Tribulation Period. At that time, God will again have his various spokesmen, two distinct witnesses, along with a group referred to as the 144,000. Daniel's 70th week spokesman. During Daniel's 70th week, the Bible identifies a special ministry imparted to two witnesses. All those wanting to know God's directives during that time must listen to God's two witnesses who will give God's message for those living at that time. Revelation 11.3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. The two witnesses will prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, that is three and one half years. See chapter 38 for a discussion of the identity of the two witnesses. In addition to the two witnesses, Revelation mentions the 144,000 Jewish male virgins, that's Revelation 14, 1 and verse 4, who act as God's spokesmen during Daniel's 70th week. Revelation 7, 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. These 144,000 witnesses are only mentioned twice in Revelation with a second time in chapter 14. Here we are given much greater detail. Revelation 14, 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood at the Mount of Zion, and with him in 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. 
These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God, to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The kingdom spokesman. The Lord's return and his second coming will end Daniel's 70th week and begin the millennium, also known as the kingdom age. God the Father, spokesman during that time, is indisputably the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be the single spokesman, king, and ruler during this literal, physical, visible 1,000-year reign on earth. The chart on page 74 is titled Prophecy, New Testament Spokesman. Revelation 19.15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation chapter 20, albeit briefly, tells about the millennium, that is the kingdom, the thousand-year reign of King Jesus upon this earth, to be right with God. Those living during the millennium must listen to Christ. Zechariah 14, 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came from Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to give the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, the punishment of all nations that come not up to the, keep the feast of the tabernacles. The Lord Jesus will rule the rod of iron as a king who knows every thought, every action, and every secret thing. Isaiah 66, 23, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Man will have no excuse for failing to follow the dictates of King Jesus, and there will be swift and grave consequences for failing to do so. Reviewing what we have studied. Throughout man's seven millennia, with one yet to come, God has chosen to give his message through a spokesman or through certain defined spokesmen. During the few recorded instances where there was no spokesman, everyone did his own thing or that which was right in his own eyes. These times of confusion are like the times when people ignore their particular spokesman or choose to follow the wrong one. Each individual must identify and follow the spokesman or spokesmen for his age. Failure to do so can result in severe consequences, including an eternity in a Christless lake of fire. With these truths firmly established, now we consider the companion doctrine of God's spokesman. If God used spokesmen, as he certainly did, God had an appointed audience addressed by each. Yet it is impossible for any man to know the identity of his spokesman or spokesman if he does not first understand his own identity whether Jews, Gentiles, or the Church of God, 1 Corinthians 10.32. Footnote number two. There are only three groups of people in the world, unsaved Jews, unsaved Gentiles, and those saved Jews and Gentiles that make up the Church of God. Take note that this is not the denomination which has hijacked the status calling themselves the Church of God. We can easily grasp these truths by considering to whom a particular spokesman addressed his primary focus and message. This is the end of chapter 4. Chapter 5, Who's Mail? Imagine sitting down to write a personal, intimate letter of instruction to a loved one. You put pen to paper, carefully addressing the recipient of the letter, and record your heart's thoughts. Once completed, you seal the letter in an envelope, address it to your intended audience, apply the necessary postage, and entrust the postman for its proper delivery. Yet something goes awry during delivery as the letter is inadvertently opened by someone other than the person to whom it was specifically intended. What could be the consequences if that letter was not only opened by the wrong individual, 
but also presume by that person to address him or her directly. This individual might benefit from the letter, yet there could be some things within the letter pertinent only to the intended recipient. In fact, reading someone else's mail could bring forth some unexpected outcomes should the reader indiscriminately apply every aspect of the letter to himself. The fact is that if misapplied by the wrong audience, some parts of the letter may turn out to be quite problematic. Now consider these same principles as they relate to Scripture. In essence, every portion of Scripture serves a personal letter, message, or epistle from God written to and focused upon a primary intended audience. This is not to imply that others outside God's primary audience cannot benefit in some way from every portion of Scripture. However, individuals and groups outside of God's intended audience should realize that portions of the letter do not directly apply to them. For this reason, identifying God's intended audience becomes as crucial as identifying the God-appointed spokesman. It is important to note that regardless of the reader, the biblical admonition applies that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Jews, Gentiles, and the Church of God. Generally speaking, the Bible identifies three main people groups. These three groups are identified as the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Church of God. 1 Corinthians 10.32 Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor the Gentiles, nor to the Church of God. All scriptures addressed to or intended for one or more of these three groups. Here is a very brief description of who they are. Jews, those naturally born into the genealogy of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Gentiles, those naturally born into any genealogy other than the previous one. The Church of God, those who have been born again. Note a man's identity in Christ trumps and negates the classifications of his natural birth. Whether Jew or Gentile, he loses his distinction within the Church of God because all are one within that body. Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Information intended specifically for one group may or may not be directly applicable to either of the other two groups. Likewise, information intended for one person or group within the larger group may not be directly applicable to others within that general audience. The next chart reflects a basic understanding of the Bible's layout as it relates to these primary people groups. Additionally, it is important to point out that overlaps or transitions between the audiences reveal the inadequacies of any rigid divisions. Distinct messages for distinct audiences. Not all of the Bible equally applies to everyone at all times. As expressed in the preceding chapters, not every commandment in the Bible is directed toward those who live during the church age. We cannot and should not follow or attempt to follow every commandment contained in the scriptures. This fact is easy to prove. Consider the answers to two questions which follow. Is God's plan for your life during the church age the same as his plan for Noah? That's the first question. God commanded Noah to make an ark of gopher wood, Genesis 6.14. Reading the context will show that this command was given to Noah because God was bringing a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. From under heaven, Genesis 6.17. If God intended for everyone to indiscriminately obey all of God's commands, what about this particular command? The chart on page 79 is titled Primary People Group Focus. Was God's plan for Noah the same as God's plan for you? Of course not. In fact, God told us as much when he promised to never again flood the earth. He promised that the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh, Genesis 9.15. Encouraging people to follow you in the building of an ark to escape any type of oncoming worldwide calamity would be an act of unbelief, disobedience, and even heresy. How then can we find value in these scriptures? Doctrinally, it is wrong for us to seek to adhere to this biblical command addressed to Noah. However, in the spirit of 2 Timothy 3.16, just as Noah obeyed God's commandments by faith, Hebrews 11.7, we are admonished to live in the same manner. We see Noah's faith through his obedience. 
faith is the constant. Without faith, it is impossible to please God regardless of the dispensation. Hebrews 11, 6. Here is the second question. Should a Christian follow a strict adherence to Levitical laws? God placed strict and orderly requirements upon the Levitical priesthood. If every command written in the Bible is to be indiscriminately followed and obeyed, what justification do we have for excluding the following directive? Leviticus 4.20 And he shall do with a bullock as he did with a bullock for a sin offering, so shall he do with this, and the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. In obedience to God, the Israelites brought a sin offering to the priest for atonement. Should we do the same with the expectation of this obedience pleasing God? Obviously not, but why not? During the church age, there's no basis for any further sacrifices. Apart from those instructions addressed to those outside the church age, there are simply no instructions involving an earthly priest sacrificing to atone and forgive anyone's sins today. In fact, the book of Hebrews specifically points to Christ as our priest. Hebrews 3.1 Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Christ is our high priest who offered himself as the final and completed sacrifice. Additionally, Romans set forth that through Christ's sacrifice, we now have the atonement. The atonement is a present possession by all those who have trusted in Christ as Savior with no need for any additional intervention. Romans 5.11 And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Prior to Christ's crucifixion, sacrifice for sin, one of the priestly functions was to make atonement for sin. In fact, during his earthly ministry, the Lord never denounced the Jews' responsibility to the Levitical priesthood. Instead, he commanded a leper whom he had healed to show himself to the priest. Christ did so in obedience to the law of Moses, Leviticus chapter 14, and for a testimony to the religious leaders. Mark 1, 44, And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded, for a testimony unto them. Page 81, the chart is titled, Priestly Atonement. This was necessary in Jesus' day, but the Levitical priesthood and their sacrifices are no longer binding upon believers today. We are not required to obey Leviticus 4.20. Neither are we to apply the truths found in Mark 1 verse 44 because both are now outside their intended application. Our high priest, Jesus Christ, provided the atonement, that is the payment, for sin through the offering of himself. Through his bodily sacrifice, we are sanctified forever. The Old Testament priest, through his many sacrifices offered year after year, could never accomplish what Jesus did through his one and final sacrifice upon the cross. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Every individual who receives the atonement mentioned in Romans 5.11 understands that there is no further need for any priestly sacrifices. Jesus Christ, through the cross of Calvary, fulfilled God's demand for a sacrifice by offering himself one time for our sins. He then sat down at the right hand of the Father. The chart on page 82 is titled, Offering for Cleansing. Why don't all those who think that the church must be patterned after verses like those from Leviticus actually put their particular commandments into practice? Most of them know how heretical this would be. If an offering or blood sacrifice is still necessary for atonement or forgiveness, this would contradict Scripture by suggesting that Christ's sacrifice of himself lacks sufficiency. Such a position is not only wrong, but blasphemous. These two examples, the one from Genesis, the command given to Noah, and the other from Leviticus concerning the priestly offering, should be obvious to any astute Bible student. However, these examples are merely offered as a representative sampling of the many other examples that exist. Failing to consider the principle that these two examples represent has caused many of the schisms and divisions found in the religious world today. 
An individual can certainly learn from reading scripture, doctrinally applicable to another group, and time, but should never usurp the teachings. These two examples prove that God never intended for every command contained in the Bible to apply indiscriminately to all. Finding my mail. It is certainly impossible to refute that different spokesmen in different ages gave different instructions from God. So whose mail or instruction should we read and obey? The diligent Bible student turns to the scripture to find the answers to all questions from the simplest to the most complex. When one does not properly identify his mail, the Bible is filled with irreconcilable commandments and questions. Should we instruct others, as did Christ, to go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Matthew 10, 5b and 6. Should we admonish our brethren to prepare for the events explained in Revelation chapter 5 through 18, where John described Daniel's 70th week? Should we pray that our flight not be on the Sabbath day, Matthew 24, 20? The answer in each of these cases is a resounding no. This mail primarily and specifically applies to others, not directly to the church age saint. Graciously, God did not leave us without light or direction. His specific directions for us can be pinpointed. They are found predominantly in the church age epistles of Romans through Jude. Those who choose to ignore the instructions in these books do so to their own peril. Where is the church? One of the greatest hints to the validity of this truth is found in the use of the word church or churches. The scripture incorporates the word church and its plural form churches a total of 117 times. Find the church and you will find your mail. Had the Lord intended to directly address the church rather than Israel throughout the Old Testament, one would think we would find mention of the church throughout those books. Yet the church is conspicuously missing from the Old Testament, nowhere to be found in those books. Had the Lord intended to directly address the New Testament church in the four Gospels, one would think the word church or churches would appear with much greater prominence than two verses. Those are Matthew 16, 18 and Matthew 18, 17. Additionally, had the Lord intended for the church to prepare for the upcoming worldwide calamity described in Revelation chapters 5 through 18, one would think he would have mentioned the church as present on earth during that period. Yet he did not. Not even once. Instead, the Lord provided a vivid illustration that we are gone prior to Revelation chapter 5 in Revelation 4.1. God's focus upon the church can be pinpointed by considering when he addresses the church. Of the 117 occurrences of church or churches, 91 appear in Romans chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 4. In addition to the three mentioned in Matthew, the remaining 23 occurrences are found in the book of Acts, 22 times with the final occurrence at the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation 22:16. The chart on page 84 is titled Church versus Israel. Based upon this single feature, one might assess that God put our names into the recipient line on the epistles from Acts through Jude, along with the first four chapters of Revelation. Note, it must be remembered that the book of Acts serves more as a historical treatise than a doctrinal one, unveiling the mysteries. To drive home this point, it must be understood that the church age remained a mystery during previous dispensations. This is why the astute Bible student will notice silence in the Old Testament concerning the faith once delivered unto the saints, for which the New Testament church should earnestly contend. That is Jude one three. In fact, the Apostle Paul claimed to be among a group identified as stewards of the mysteries of God. 1 Corinthians 4.1 the contrast of the church age epistles to the gospels is quite significant. The gospels identified the mysteries of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 11, while the epistles unveiled the mysteries concerning Christ and the church, Ephesians 5, 32. Paul set forth that the holy apostles and prophets, Ephesians 3, 5, were chosen to reveal mysteries kept secret since the world began, Romans 16, 25. He also pointed out that these apostles and prophets made known unto us the mystery of his, that is, God's will, Ephesians 1, 9. To confirm the validity of this claim, consider how the following passages clearly emphasize 
the unveiling of the mysteries to the church in Paul's epistles. Romans 11.25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Romans 16.25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. 1 Corinthians 15.51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Ephesians 3.3, 3, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ephesians 3.9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Ephesians 6.19. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. God wrote very personal and important letters to the New Testament church. When he did so, he directly addressed the church and incorporated the unveiling of the mysteries pertaining to them. Considering the volume and emphasis of Paul's epistles, Paul certainly served as God's primary spokesman for the church. In many cases, Paul declared truths to the church and concerning the church that had remained a mystery prior to the penning of his epistles. On page 86, the chart is titled, Mystery, Kingdom versus Church. These truths may seem difficult to grasp or troubling to consider, especially for those accustomed to reading and applying the Scripture rather indiscriminately. Yet, the vast majority of the Bible-believing, Bible-living Christians implement these principles without considering why they do so. For example, consider the Scriptures most often employed by those attempting to lead lost souls to trust in Christ as their Savior. The Romans wrote, Soul winners have instinctively use verses from the book of Romans because they offer a complete, concise picture of what one must know and believe in order to be saved. These verses have become so common in soul-winning discussions that they have been coined the Romans road to salvation. Is it merely coincidental that these verses occur in Paul's first epistle? No. Nor is it simply instinct that leads people to this book but it is rather the guiding hand of the Spirit of God. Romans 8.14, Galatians 5.18. On page 87, the chart is entitled, Mysteries Kept Secret. Why do you suppose so many soul winners are led by the Spirit of God to go to the epistles of the Apostle Paul? The answer is quite simple. God called preachers and teachers, along with evangelistically minded Christians, followed the precepts of rightly dividing the word of truth in practice without considering why. The answer as to why is quite revealing. Through supernatural prodding and scriptural logic, the soul winner gravitates toward the church age epistles while still obediently reading everyone else's mail, Genesis through Revelation. This is also why the true soul winner repudiates methods used by lordship salvation preachers who get the cart before the horse. A man simply cannot make Christ lord of his life before the new birth. On page 88 is a chart that shows the scriptural admonition in one column and the acknowledgments in the second column. It is a soul winning chart. The scriptural admonition, number one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The acknowledgement of the sinner would be such. Realize that you are a sinner. Quote, I know that I have broken the laws of God and am a sinner. And my sin causes me to come short of God's perfect standard. Number two, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. Here's the acknowledgement. Believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins. Quote, I believe that Christ died for my sins and rose from the dead for my justification. See also 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Number three, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Here's the acknowledgement. 
accept God's gift of salvation. Quote, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I accept his gift of salvation freely given to me based on the promise of God. Number four, and lastly, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's Romans 10, 9, and 10, and verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's the acknowledgement. Ask the Lord to save you by simply trusting in him and his word. Quote, I believe God wants to forgive my sins and has graciously provided the way for me to receive that payment on my behalf. Now, in your own words, if you are ready to trust in Christ, ask him to forgive you and save you. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Certainly the plan for man's salvation through Christ's shed blood was in effect prior to Paul's epistles. Yet most of these related truths were not unveiled until Paul's ministry and writings. Consider three truths to prove this point. Paul set forth that Christ died for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, became sin for us, and that we must trust in his sacrificial death to have forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, 13, in whom ye also trust, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. These truths existed and applied prior to Paul writing about them. But the specific written revelations were given primarily to Paul. In fact, many of these truths could not be completely revealed prior to the cross. Think about it. Had Satan known what we know today, he would not have instigated the betrayal and crucifixion of God's Son. The truth concerning the crucifixion remained a mystery until after the cross. Other than the Lord, no one fully grasped its purpose prior to the cross. The Bible points out, that had the princes of this world, Ephesians 2, 2, known the mystery concerning God's plan, they would not have crucified Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, But we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The reason believers are naturally drawn to the epistles as their primary tool for witnessing is because of the mysteries revealed to Paul, including the full revelation of the gospel, the grace of God. These epistles awaiting our opening contain our primary mail. It is God's message to us. It is God's message for us as ambassadors to take to others. Allow the scripture to identify the target audiences. Before proceeding, one must consider some common pitfalls associated with the truths presented herein. Asking a newborn babe in Christ or a less mature saint to rightly divide the word of truth is like handing a toddler a sword and asking him to carefully cut his steak for supper. One of the greatest disservices to the scriptures over the years has been this need to create robotic divisions whereby people mindlessly plug things into various dispensations based upon their location in the Bible. Such an environment is no better than the one created by the hyper-Calvinist system that allows them to mindlessly read the elect into passages that say absolutely nothing about the so-called elect. The reality is that context always rules the interpretation of any passage. Always. In other words, regardless of where a passage is found, context must always be allowed to determine the targeted recipients of the mail being delivered. Paul certainly identified his audience in Romans 1-7 when he said, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. He did the same in 1 Corinthians 1 2, 2 Corinthians 1 1, Galatians 1 2, Ephesians 1 1, Philippians 1 1, Colossians 1 2, 1 Thessalonians 1 1, 2 Thessalonians 1 1, 1 Timothy 1 2, 2 Timothy 1 2, Titus 1 4, and Philemon 1 1. James identified his initial target audience in James 1 1. Peter identified his audience in 1 Peter 1 verses 1 and 2, and 2 Peter 1, 1, and John identified his audiences in 2 John 1, 1, and 3 John 1, 1. Even within the church age epistles, identifying the audience helps understand why 1 Corinthians might differ in focus from 1 and 2 Timothy. It helps the reader understand why the book of James might read differently than the book of Romans. Some of these epistles were written to all the saints in an area. Others were written to individuals 
Some epistles focused upon a particular group, but all of these epistles and the others are within the bounds of being addressed to the church of God. That is the end of chapter 5.